So today we're taking a look at the Benchmark AHB2 amplifier. Now this amplifier is special. And if you are an audiophile, depending on the type of audiophile you are, this may be not only the last amplifier you buy, but the only amplifier you will ever need, regardless of price. Now, trust me when I say that I have heard a lot of amplifiers that promises transparency, detail, lowest distortion possible, but there is really no proof when it comes down to it. There is no proof other than the fact that you have to listen with your ears. Well, Benchmark is one of those companies that has proved on paper that their amplifier is the lowest distortion possible with specs to prove it and back it up. And the outcome of that product is the Benchmark AHB2 amplifier. Now, the thing that I like about Benchmark is that as a company, they are not only relying on measurements, but they also do heavy listening tests. And their words, not mine, they suggest that impressive measurements do not necessarily guarantee that transparency has been achieved. Transparency must be confirmed with a listening test. And personally, I have to fully agree with that. And for the longest time, I have been trying to listen to the Benchmark AHB2 in my own system. I have heard the AHB2 briefly in other systems here and there, but I never got to try it my, for myself in my system. And finally, I have bought not one, but two, and we'll talk about the reason why, to try it out in my system, and I can't wait to share it with you in this video. But first, let's look at the unit and talk about some of the wonderful technology that is implemented into this small amplifier. Now, it uses a feed for error correction technology patented by THX, making perhaps the AHB2 one of the quietest and the lowest distortion amplifier to be ever made. Looking at the small form factor of an amplifier, I mean, it's about two palms width. It is very, very small for this type of amplifier. And wait till I get to the power rating. You might expect that this amplifier is a class D amplifier. However, in fact, the AHB2 is not a class D amplifier. The AHB2 is actually a combination of a class AB technology and class H with a unique feed forward system that I just talked about a few moments earlier. And according to Benchmark, not only does this topology decrease the distortion and noise level to basically the lowest ever possible, but it rivals the highest grade class A, class D, you name it, in other measurement performances as well, one of them being the crossover distortion. So there's so much that goes into the specifics and the technology of this amplifier that I just cannot go over all of it in this video. So if you're interested in more of this error correction and distortion minimi minimizing technology that they did to this amplifier, I'll link to that in the description below because they have Oh, entire page of it. So safe to say that the Benchmark HB2 is not just any other amplifier, but is an innovative product with real, real technology involved. Now the Benchmark HB2, before we get to the power rating, by the way, which is ridiculous, is actually a high current amplifier as well, being able to drive really hard to drive speakers with authority and drive, but also it, it can handle really low impedances as well, down to even 1.6 ohms. Well, what does this mean? Well, it virtually means that this amplifier, despite its size, can drive virtually any speakers out there, which is incredible. Now, let's talk about the power output. This tiny small amplifier, when it's used in stereo mode as a single unit, can output 100 watts per channel into 8 ohms, 130 watts into 6 ohms, 190 watts into 4 ohms, and 240 watts into 3 ohms. Now that is impressive amount of power for such a tiny amplifier, and to be able to drive to that low of an impedance means that virtually a single unit can drive most speakers out there. But just in case you have really high demands or need for that power for extra headroom, well, remember how, how I said that this is in stereo mode? Well this can be run in mono block or mono mode with a switch on the back. 
Flip the switch on both amplifiers to mono mode. When used as a mono block, the HB2 can output 200 watts into 16 ohms, a whopping 380 watts into 8 ohms, and 480 watts into 6 ohms. Which is, by the way, absolutely crazy for this small amplifier that you can lift with one hand. Now just keep in mind that when you're running these in monoblock configuration to read the manual as the positives become now negative and positive as I'm showing here in the back of the amplifier. Now the binding post on this amplifier is not the worst thing, but it's not my favorite either. As if you're using spade cables, it has a insertion at the bottom. And if you're using heavy or big speaker cables, then it will lift the amplifier or you just won't be able to connect it to the amplifier at all because of its limited ability to use spade connections. Now I found this very odd, but it's not things that I haven't seen before. So I did some digging on the Benchmark website and it seems that they're not a fan of spade plugs or spade connectors because it has variable results when they measure. So I looked into what they actually use and they do sell their own cables and also speak on connections, which is what they find to be most reliable. And yes, this amplifier does have speak on connections on the back if you decide to buy the benchmark cables. So you can buy the cables from benchmark and use the speak on connectors on the back of this unit, but also they advocate for locking banana speaker cables. Now, specifically locking bananas, not normal ones. And I do have the blue jean cables and that is the cable that I used in this video, specifically the locking banana cables throughout my listening sessions because that's what they recommend with their amplifier product. Now, did I notice a very big change in sound or even a slight change in sound when I changed from spade to banana? No, not, not a huge difference with the benchmark amplifier. However, it is just much more convenient to use locking banana cables on this amplifier as the spade connection, like I mentioned, is not that convenient. In fact, I had to lift the amplifier like this and then like try to finagle the spade inside because the opening wasn't very, you know, forgiving to put in the spades. So just try to use the speaker con connection or the banana or locking banana specifically recommended by Benchmark. It is their product after all, and I trust them to use the right type of cabling. Now, another thing to notice on the back of this unit is that it doesn't have RCA or single-ended inputs. It only has balanced inputs which means that you can use a RCA to XLR conversion cable if your preamplifier doesn't have balanced connections, but there is something also that you need to pay a close attention to on the back of the unit for those situations, and that is the sensitivity or gain switch. Now this has three different settings, and the most lowest setting is the one that you would use on professional preamplifiers that has a fully balanced topology. The middle one is the one that I use most often on this amplifier as it is the safest uh, between balanced or RCA based preamplifiers. And what these adjustments really are is gain. So when you're switching them, make sure that the amplifier is turned off or the volume is fully down. Because if not, you're gonna get a loud sudden noise when you increase the gain. Now, when you go to the highest setting, that is the one that you would use if you are using a RCA cable. Now you can use the middle setting if you are using RCA cables. However, just make sure that you're using the right type of cables recommended by Benchmark, as well as the right sensitivity settings. Now, why is the sensitivity setting so important? Well, it's because it relates to the sound quality as well. Benchmark specifically states that the wrong setting on this sensitivity would allow for the pre-amplifier's noise to transfer to the amplifier therefore amplifying distortion. So make sure to have the right sensitivity setting on this amplifier when you're using it. Now, I wondered how the sensitivity setting would transfer in real life situations where like, would it be audible for me to hear those distortions or whatever is going on and what would that effect be? So on purpose, I tried all three settings on a RCA cable to balanced and et cetera. I fooled around with it with multiple different preamplifiers. And it seems like that if you put the low gain setting on situations where you're using RCA cables, for example, you get this dull, lifeless, flat, very neutral, but like n dynamic compression kind of sound where it sounds compressed, almost rolled off and unexciting. 
when you put it on the higher setting than you should, it sounds bright, brittle, and almost like there's some type of uh, high frequency distortion going on that is a bit like ringing. It's unpleasant to the ear. Now, when I had the right setting for the preamplifiers that I was using, which may take some experimentation on your end, but you do hear the differences and it is sonically distinguishable if you are doing the right thing or not because it will be either too bright or too dull sounding. You know you stroke the right setting when you can listen to it and it seems neutral, transparent, without brittle and brightness and dullness or compression. This amplifier is very transparent. And when the setting is right, this amplifier can be a reference. And talking about reference, this amplifier is also used in studios naturally because of its transparent, uncolored, neutral nature. In fact, if you go on the website for extra $100, they sell a rack mount or for studios as an option. They have the silver faceplate and the black faceplate, but I personally really like the black, all black look on this amplifier much more than the silver faceplate. And oh, almost forgot, this amplifier is packed with features. No, this small amplifier, not only does it have great technology with all these wonderful measurements and innovations into it, but in the front, not only do you see a power switch, thank you, front power switches, but it also has these indicators or LEDs to let you know for temperature control, peaking, clipping, muting, and it goes through this LED pattern when it goes on standby and when it comes back to life. And if you even if you forget to turn it off, it goes on standby on its own after a certain amount of time. So this amplifier is really well thought out and designed. And when you start using it, you can really tell that this is an amplifier that is well thought out to be reliable, be, to be used on a constant basis, and to be long lasting. Now, I don't, I, this one of these amplifiers that I imagine will last 10 plus years, 20, 30 years, 40 years without any problem whatsoever. Now, obviously I can't guarantee that, but the feeling I get when I have this amplifier is that this, despite its size, is a tank and a beast of an amplifier that can drive literally any speaker. Now, the important thing is how does it sound? And this is the thing that I was really wondering for myself about this amplifier. Because quite frankly, audiophiles, the meaning of audiophiles, even if you type it on Google, will tell you it is to get the artist's intent, right? To have no barrier, have the most transparency between the loudspeaker and the listener so that you seem to get exactly what was recorded in the studios. And that is the quote unquote ultimate goal of being an audiophile. Now, we all know that there are many different types of audiophiles, including tube audiophiles like myself, vintage, you know, some people like it this way, some people like it that way. There's, it's a very preference-based hobby. So, or passion, right? But again, if you are that audiophile that is looking for absolute transparency, well, regardless of price, I don't think it gets better than the Benchmark AHB2. This is the most neutral amplifier, regardless of class D, class A, class AB, that I've tested. In my own listening tests that I've done with multiple speakers that I have, you know, that I have in here, it seems like this amplifier has almost no color. There is no color to be had. There's no exaggeration in the bass, in the mid bass, in the highs. It just seems like a blank canvas. In fact, the way I found out is the hard way. When I was listening to the AHB2, I was thinking that it was slightly, ever so slightly co colored. And I was like, of course, there is no amplifier that is absolutely neutral and absolutely transparent. But after switching my preamplifiers and switching this and that in my system, I realized, and these are components that I know very well, I realized that the benchmark, all it was doing was showing me the coloration of whatever was in my system. So it was not the benchmark that was coloring whatever a little bit, but it was the rest of my components, like my preamplifier, DAC, you know, stuff like that. So in reality, every time I switched something, I got the truth of what the coloration of my preamplifier was, what my DAC was, and what my speakers were doing. And the benchmark was just out of the way. It just seemed like the benchmarks were transferring whatever that I was putting into it with no 
lies, just absolute truth. So truly, the benchmark HB2 is something that audiophiles have been trying to achieve for the longest time, that faithful reproduction of music as the artist intended. And it should be the quote-unquote end game. But I eventually sold the benchmark HB2s. That's right, I don't have it here with me anymore. I used to work in studio, so as someone who has studio experience, I appreciate the benchmark for what it does, the absolute transparency, the absolute truth. However, that is not something I want personally in my home system. I value the benchmark HB2 as a tool. However, for me, I'm not looking for a tool, I'm looking for home entertainment and to tweak things, as you guys know, I like tube amplifiers to make the sound bloom, to make a sound larger than the artist intended, make it deeper sounding, make it wide, make it pleasant for my ears. So for me, the absolute truth hurt. And the guy who bought it from me also has studio background and he wanted the absolute truth. And buying this, interestingly, he said, well, Jay, you know what? I know that I'm gonna go through my records and one third of them is gonna be the only ones that's gonna sound good with it. But I'm okay with that because I'm gonna learn the truth about my records and how they were recorded. And then he added, sometimes the truth hurts. Smart guy. But personally, for me, I like to listen to music and I like to listen to music in my own terms that sounds good to my ears and I have some really bad poor recordings that my mother and my grandfather used to listen to, Korean music, you know, stuff like that, that just wasn't recorded very well, but I still enjoy them. Can you guys relate? And for me, I could not listen to those recordings with the benchmark HP2 as some recordings would just be ripped to shreds. It will show you every flaw. And if you have speakers like the one that I tried was, was the KLH Model 5. Now the KLH Model 5 is a great speaker and when I sent it over to the NRC to get it measured, which is posted on the Soundstage website, I'll link it in the description below for you to check out the measurements, uh, it's a really well measuring speaker. And I've tried it with Q Acoustic Q50s. I've tried it with the Orendo 1723 THX speakers. I've tried it with multiple speakers, not just those. And when I tried it, I was hearing through my speakers all the details, all the good things that the speakers were doing, all the bad things the speakers were doing, but also the recordings, right? If the recording didn't have any bloom or didn't have any uh, brightness, I mean, try, try listening to modern recording with this uh, amplifier was an absolute nightmare. Because what I noticed was that a lot of the modern recordings, well, I realized this a long time ago, adds a lot of excitement on the top end, especially hip hop or pop, right? Because you're hearing with these little earphones nowadays, so they exaggerate detail or treble. So in my system with a neutral speaker, with the HB2, I'm not running a studio here, right? But I was hearing all the flaws in the recording all the intentions so and so will. And that's not just what I wanted because I have, like I said, some recordings that I just want to enjoy without knowing the truth because the truth hurts. These were some terrible, terribly recorded and mastered recordings, but they have some nostalgia. They have some enjoyment that's, that's uh, emotional to me. But with the benchmark, I couldn't enjoy it emotionally. Now, I'm not saying the benchmark is bad for enjoyment when you put on a good recording that you like, right? It is just unbelievable. It is just absolutely unbelievable with all the micro details, the dynamics, the punch, the, the rumble. If the recording has it, the benchmark will show it to you without any exaggeration exactly what the recording is showing you. Now, it's very arrogant for me to say that, you know, I know exactly, you know, what these artists intended because I used to work in studios. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that's the feeling I get with the Benchmark AHP2 because it's so transparent and neutral. It sounds to me really, really good with really good, well-recorded music, and it doesn't sound so good as I get all the flaws that I hear in recordings that I know is not recorded very well because of the era or because of the technology available at the time, yada, yada, da, right? There's no way of knowing the actual intentions of the artist. There is no absolute transfer from the studio to your home. 
different environment, different speakers, different amplifiers, and so on. They didn't use benchmark. We don't know that, right? So anyways, benchmark to me sounds dynamic, transparent, neutral, open, with reasonable sound stage. It's not the largest sound stage. It is real. Again, if the recording has a lot of reverb and was mixed and mastered in such a way to have this, you know, one of those recordings that's more ambient, then the benchmark will show you that without exaggeration, in my opinion, or underplaying it. It will show you just that. And of course, your speaker's capability come to, comes into play as well. So the benchmark doesn't really increase or decrease soundstage. It just seems to be showing you what's in the recording and what your speakers are capable of. So I can't really say this, is, this has a large or intimate soundstage. It really depends. I've heard the benchmark with speakers and recordings that has really large ambience and it had enormous ambience and uh, en enormous sound staging. But when I heard it with recordings that didn't have that with a speaker, for example, that doesn't have a large sound stage like the Orendo 1723 THX tower speakers, then I heard a more focused speaker to speaker sound stage, right? It wasn't bad, it was intimate, it seemed accurate, but it was more to speak to the speaker's ability to sound stage and the recording that I was playing more than the benchmark sound staging. So that's something that you have to keep in mind is that the benchmark, even to the down to the sound staging and imaging relies on the recording and the faithful reproduction and your speaker's capability. So the benchmark AHB2 is really not just transparent in the sound, but the transfer of sound. It is transparent in, in the transfer of sound in your system. So if you have something in your system that just doesn't agree with the benchmark, then it's gonna show you that. Is that bad or is that good? I don't know. For me, that's not personally what I wanted. But if you're like the guy that bought the benchmark from me that knew that he wants the absolute truth, then yes, that's a good thing. Like I said in the beginning of this video, if you are the type of the audiophile that wants truth, that is wanting faithful reproduction, the original, I guess, uh, hate saying that, but the you know original meaning of audiophilia, right? Your truthful reproduction of what was intended, and that's what you want. The benchmark HB2 seems to be the best amplifier that gets closest to that, from what I've heard so far. In my experience, with the correct setting, correct setup with the benchmarks, and it's always important with units like this because if you want absolute truth with a unit like this then you have to wonder about what is the truth of your system right now as well, not just the recording. Just because you have a neutral amplifier doesn't mean the rest of your system is neutral. So the benchmark HB2, like I said, shows you the absolute truth. And it's a transparent amplifier like none other that I've come across. The other ones like class D amplifiers that's absolutely transparent and detailed. Yes, they're detailed. There may be some transparency, but not like this, right? It doesn't have the dryness of the some class D amplifier, uh, that glassiness that I heard on some class D amplifiers. Even the greatest class D amplifiers with purify modules these days that I've heard don't match up to the benchmarks. And the benchmarks were released like seven years ago, I think. So that says something. That must say something. So that's pretty much it for me with the benchmark AHB2. I had a great experience with it. Hope this video was helpful to you. If it was, then make sure to subscribe for more videos on what I'm doing in my system, what I'm changing out, what I'm trying out, and to you know I share these things with you. So make sure you're subscribed for those uh, similar videos and make sure you click the like button on this video if it was helpful for you. And I hope to see you guys very soon again on this channel. Until next time.